1 Timothy 1, verse number 16, it's actually the theme verse for the book, Captured by Grace. Paul writes, I was captured by grace so that Jesus Christ could display through me the outpouring of his spirit as a pattern to be seen for all those who would believe in him for eternal life. I was captured by grace. Take one of your hands, set it on your heart. I want you to say it out loud with all you got, church. Come on, say eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to receive, a mouth to confess, all the good things. I can't hear you. All the good things Christ has already provided for me. Now be a blessing. Just look across the aisle say, God's got some goodness for you too. Come on, tell him. God's got some goodness for you too. He really does. Well, hello, church, and I want to say welcome to the seventh and final message in the series that I've been bringing you called Captured by Grace, and it's based on my brand new book. Pastor Jacob, run up here real quick with those books. It's based on my new book by the same title, Captured by Grace, Be Freed from Fear So You Can Really Live. That's right, and hold this for just a second. Don't start preaching, just hold it. And uh, I know there's an anointing on it, but don't mess with it. Uh, there's, uh, there's three books here, Captured by Grace, Be Freed from Fear So You Can Really Live. Uh, today's the last day that we're going to make them available just out there in the lobby. You can get it anywhere books are sold, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, wherever you get your books. But uh, I want to be sure we get it in your hands. We've been walking through this book in our gospel circles. I want you to do me a favor, if you would, just kind of walk through this worship center, and I want you to bless Three people, three people that look happy, three people that wave at you, three people that don't have it, and we want to give it to them. Would you do that? And so if you don't get one, don't hate, celebrate. Come on, somebody. Matter of fact, if you've read the book and you enjoy it, don't forget, go to Amazon and leave a review. If you don't like the book, stay away from Amazon. Come on, somebody. So I, I hope you're doing well today and that you're ready for a powerful talk that I think is going to change your life, a talk that's going to tie up, I think, some loose ends and show you how incredibly powerful the grace of God can be in your daily life when you understand it and when you live from it. And so today's talk is based on the subject of the final chapter of the book, and it's called Legal Versus Vital. And uh, what exactly does that mean, legal versus vital? Well, I want to begin with, with a story. I think we've all heard the old saying, life's a journey, not a destination. When I was a, uh, a young boy, our family would go on some sort of family trip, and I'd ask, you know, Dad, uh, how much longer till we get there? And his answer was usually the same. He'd say, son... We're about five minutes closer than we were the last time you asked. And then I thought about this a few years later. I came to the point anticipating my uh, high school graduation, you know, for four straight years. I couldn't wait until the day that I donned, you know, my cap and gown and I walked across that stage and finally received my diploma. But as that day finally approached my senior year, my dad once again shared some valuable insight. And he said this to me. He said, son, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of your accomplishments. Your graduation is going to be one of the proudest moments of your life. But here's the truth. Watch. He said, it's just the beginning. It's not the finish line. And as I think about my dad explaining to me the meaning of the word commencement, I realize that there are many, many believers today who need my dad's wisdom as well. Not in relation to graduation, but with regard to the spiritual life that you are to enjoy in Christ Jesus. Because sometimes I think when folks receive Jesus, they look at it as mission accomplished because they believe they've hit the ultimate spiritual Jackpot, And I will say this, in a sense, they're certainly correct. Think about it. At that very moment, they experience God's 
total and complete forgiveness. They receive, the Bible says, everything they need for life and godliness. Yet at the same time, you need to understand this moment is similar to a commencement ceremony. It's really a beginning more than an end. When Jesus promised to give us abundant life, he was not suggesting that this was the last stop on a trip. Rather, he was saying this is the first of many. And he says this, the trip you're about to take only gets brighter and brighter and brighter. So the very day you were saved, grace was powerfully at work in your life. But your encounter with grace was only the beginning of a lifelong process of learning now to live in and from the wellspring of God's grace. When you first got saved, I would say it like this, it was mostly the legal aspect of grace. That's what overwhelmed you as it should have. In fact, it should still overwhelm us. Y'all, let me talk to you. Every day, the fact that your sins are forgiven, the fact that sin and death has been defeated over your life, the fact that you will never face God's judgment. Let me tell you something. These are all things that should never cease to amaze us. But there's more to grace than just its legal dimension. The legal aspect, it is critical because it means that you are no longer guilty. You have been completely set free based on the price Jesus paid, thank God. But the vital nature, not the legal, the vital nature of grace is equally important for you to grasp. So what is the vital nature of grace? Here it is. It's the power God gives us now to walk with him every day and fulfill his divine destiny for our lives. And I know we love to sing about grace. We'll sing about the legal nature of grace and we'll say amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me and praise God that's true. But thank God grace did not end at that moment of truth. God's unmerited grace is what saved you for sure, but you need to understand it is his unlimited grace that now empowers you to live an abundant, supernatural, now I'm gonna mess with you, and otherwise impossible life to live. Now I like to say that, and when I do, some of you say, now hold on, Pastor Ben, you just said impossible, that's, that's, that's not good news. I mean, my goodness, that's, that's pretty discouraging. All right, listen. The fact is that there is only one person in all the universe who can live the so-called Christian life successfully. It is not you. It is not me. It is not Mother Teresa. It is not Billy Graham. The only person who is able to live the Christian life with 100% success, are you ready, is Jesus. And that's the miracle of God's vital grace in your daily life. God isn't asking you to try to live some kind of impossible life. I'll hear people talking, they'll say, oh, I became a Christian and this thing became so difficult. No, it's not difficult, it's impossible. He's asking you now to allow, God's saying, allow the life of Christ, allow Jesus now to live his life in and through you. Wow. Wow. And we so badly need to grasp this. The church has got to grasp this. We need to understand. I believe this is a prophetic word. We have got to understand that while his legal grace saves us, his empowering grace is what's vital. His vital grace is what empowers us. For some of you, you've got to move to the next dimension of grace. Grace Saving grace is what carried you, but now you carry his empowering grace into every activity every day. Saving grace was done for you, but empowering grace is God's presence in you and through you. 
Saving grace operates vertically from heaven to earth, but empowering grace operates horizontally through you to others. And you see, all Christians, I think, understand, watch this, you've been saved from something. You'll hear Christians, they'll talk about what I was saved from, but watch this. A lot of Christians know they've been saved from something, but here's the problem. A whole lot of us don't know you've been saved for something. Not just from something, but for something. God brought you out, not just to bring you out, but to bring you in. And that's why Philippians 1 verse 6, y'all, it feels good today. Philippians 1 verse 6 says what? That there's a work in us that God started and which he will also be faithful to complete in us. That's why Hebrews 12 verse 2 refers to Jesus, watch this, as the author and the finisher of our faith. One contemporary translation says the, found, the fountainhead and conclusion of our faith. Ephesians 2 10, I love this one, says what? That you are are God's workmanship. I love this. You have been created in Christ Jesus. Watch to do good works. You have been created in Christ Jesus. It says to do good works. Oh my goodness. Ben Daly said works. You have been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which it says God has prepared beforehand in advance for you to do, I want you to see it. God's workmanship, you've been created in Christ to do good works. Don't you miss this? Created in Christ to do good works, not dead works. Not dead works. Watch, what's the difference? Good works is what you do as a result of knowing you are loved and accepted. Good works is what you do as a result of already knowing you're loved and accepted. Well, what in the world is dead works? Let me tell you, some of you, some of you living this way, I'll tell you what dead works is, and this is what Paul deals with over and over and over again. It's this, dead works is what you do, watch, to try to earn God's love and acceptance. Good works is what you do because you know you are loved and accepted. Dead works is what you do to try to earn God's love and acceptance. And if you're thankful today, you've already got his love and acceptance. You ought to clap your hands and I think you can do better than that. Come on. Holler it out. Say, I already got it. Then smile. Galatians 2 verse 20 says what? That we've been crucified with Christ. Look at this. It's no longer we who even live, but now Christ lives in us by what? Faith. Not even our faith, but the faith of God. It's not what you believe. It's what God already believes true about you. So with these things in mind, I just want to share quickly a series of three powerful prophetic truths that I think are really going to help you, church, to understand more clearly how this vital grace of God is designed to work in your life. Look at those notes on the Calvary app where it says, walking in the power of God's vital grace. Three things are going to help you consciously walk uh, in the vitality of God's grace every day, each day, every day. So these are prophetic things that I'm declaring over this church. Church, hear me. For where we are and where God's taking us, these things are absolutely critical. One, write it down. I would say this. Expect. There's got to be an expectation. Expect the power of grace in your everyday life. Expect the power of grace in your everyday life. Let me tell you, a confident expectation. Oh, my goodness. Where is your hope? A confident expectation. And let's be honest and admit that many times we don't live with a very high expectation of God we see the chaos of a fallen world all around us some of you you sit all day looking at what's going on in the world around you and then you've got the compulsions of the flesh and and uh, we assume that we'll never quite escape the plight of of feeling trapped some of you you feel trapped in hurts and some of you feel trapped in habits and we become content to know that, well, we're going to heaven someday, I hope, which is great, but we fail to expect God to show up powerfully in our lives right here and right now. And we think that being saved from hell 
is enough and we don't understand that he also came to save us from the hellish nightmare of living on earth without any hope of real and lasting inward change. Well, I'm here with some good news. How many of you are ready for good news? Say yes. If you want good news, Calvary Church is the place for you. If you want bad news, you can go anywhere else because I'm kind of a one-trick pony. I only give you good news. Come on. Here it is. Are you ready? Say yes. The inward change, uh uh-oh, has already occurred. So the moment you trusted Christ was the moment everything about your inner spirit, the Bible says, radically transformed from the inside out. We talked about this. We talked about this last week. I'm not going to get into it right now, but spirit and then uh, soul, right? And the reality is soul, mind, uh, will, uh, your uh, emotions. The, 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 the reality is, and don't miss it. Well, did I feel that change? Well, you, you, you may have experienced some, I don't know, some powerful emotions when you first got saved, but here's what I want you to understand. The, 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 those emotions, while, while good, aren't what we base our confidence upon. You have to understand this. Honestly, there are many mornings. Now, I'm going to pull the curtain back just a little bit. There are many mornings that I wake up and i got to confess to you, church, that I don't feel like a new creation. I don't, I don't feel it. As a matter of fact, there are times, this may shock you, there are times that I'm frustrated. There are times that I'm impatient. I know this is shocking my wife. She's never seen me that way ever. Just times that I'm frustrated and impatient with myself because I see habits and I see trends and I see behavior and I see thinking patterns that cause me to wonder if, oh God, am I maturing on schedule that you have for me? And in my case, now I'm going to get really honest with you. I am a pastor. I am a spiritual leader. So the pressure can sometimes feel even heavier when I put expectations on myself that I fear I will not live up to but you don't have to be a leader in God's church to understand the pressure of wanting to perform better today than you did yesterday and part of the battle is what it's you beginning to understand that pressure like that does not come from your heavenly Father. Now, it's going to come from a whole lot of other things. There's a thousand and one other sources we could talk about. We could talk about a religious culture you grew up in. We could talk about a legalistic mindset. We could talk about a dysfunctional, perfectionist past, all kind of stuff. But it does not come from your spirit. It does not come from your heavenly Father. At the moment that you venture back, chapter 1, you venture back into the jungle of religion, that legalistic way of relating to God let me tell you something that is the moment that joy gets sucked out of your life let me tell you why some of you have no strength it's because you lost your joy and it isn't that God does not care about our behavior he certainly does but he knows and we also got to understand that there is no such thing as shaming yourself into greater maturity And I know a lot of folk think that's the way we do it. We shame ourselves into greater maturity. No. No. The fact of the matter is that you are on a journey. And here's the good news. You're on a journey with Jesus. And the internal work has already been done. Let me tell you something. The realm of faith right here, your spirit, the internal work has already been done. But what's the journey? It's not even spiritual growth. It's actually soul growth. The journey has already been done here. Now, what's the journey? Now we're learning soul. We're learning to allow the life of Jesus to now be expressed in and through us more consistently as we grow. So it'll manifest through us. I guess we could say body 
uh, here, three-part being. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. The reality is, if you really want to enjoy life, you got to start living from this place. And the truth is, you're not transformed by the renewing of your spirit. It's already done. You're now transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what's happening. So here's the deal. If you don't understand this primary foundational truth to expect the power of grace every single day of your life, no matter how well or poorly you have recently performed, you are going to be paralyzed in your growth process. And a lot of you, this is what you've experienced. You're paralyzed in the growth process. Why? Two things I'm going to give you. This is powerful. Two things. It's thinking. It's thinking. Here's one thought. Well, I performed so well today, uh, God has really got to be pleased with me. I performed so well today that God has really got to be pleased with me. But then something negative happens to you, and then you feel ripped off. And then you're like, well, where was God? I thought he would treat me better than that based upon my impressive behavior. I mean, look what I did, God. So you've got to be pleased with me. So there's one. Then the other way of thinking is this. Well, I performed so poorly today, God must be disgusted with me. Well, I performed so poorly today, I gave into that lust, I gave into that greed, I gave into that pride, I gave into that anger, so God must be disgusted with me, and then you condemn yourself, convinced that you've disqualified yourself from ever receiving his unmerited, unlimited blessing and favor and power. Two ways of thinking. Now watch. The first scenario, I've performed so well that God owes me a blessing leads to what is called, write it down, self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. The second scenario, I've performed so poorly that God must be mad at me, leads to what's called self-condemnation. Self-condemnation. And the gospel is designed to keep you out of both those ditches, self-righteousness and self-condemnation. When we've performed well, what do we do? We lift up our hands and we give glory to God for his power in and through our lives. And when we don't perform well, what do we do? We worship him for the cross where that sin has already been paid for. And then what do we do? We get back up on our feet and we keep going. As a matter of fact, I feel this in me right now. This is a word for some of you that have fallen and say you can't get up. May you hear the Spirit of God today. If you've fallen and say you can't get up, may you hear the gospel. And I declare because of Jesus, it's time for you to get back up and move forward in Jesus' name. If you believe it, give him praise right now. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. So the point is this. We must learn to expect the power of God's grace in our lives every day, regardless of our recent track record, because by definition, grace is completely and utterly disconnected from our track record in the first place, which is precisely what makes it grace. It is not earned. It is not enhanced by our obedience or by our success. And on the other side, it is not threatened and it is not diminished by our disobedience or our failure. So we've got to train ourselves. This is why you need the local church. Because you need to be trained in the area of your soul. Let me tell you something. This is where the fight of faith is. What are you going to believe today? Are you going to believe this realm? Or are you going to believe this realm? Are you going to believe the eternal realm? Or are you going to believe the temporary realm? Are you going to believe the realm of faith or are you going to believe the realm of senses, what you see and hear and feel? Are you going to believe what God believes true or are you going to believe what the world's telling you? You've got to choose, what am I going to believe today? That's how you win. That's why I'm telling you you're not a victim. The truth of the matter is we want to look at everything going on in the world and say, I'm just a victim. But I declare over every one of you, lift up your hands and lift up your head. Greater is he who is in you than anything that's going on in this world. And I declare life is not going to reign over you. You are going to reign in life. And if i got a church that believes it, clap your hands and give God praise. And I need 200 of you. Shout right now. Come on. Hallelujah.
Are y'all getting this? So we got to train ourselves. Matter of fact, to wake up every single day. Let me tell you something now more than ever. You wake up every single day, no matter how you feel in the moment, with an attitude of confident expectation. Lift up your hands. I speak prophetically over you now. In the name of Jesus, you wake up with an expectation that your good and gracious Father, I declare, has a dump truck load of grace that he is ready to pour out in your life every single day. You wake up with an expectation in the name of Jesus. I'm going to say it every day this week that my God has tilted the universe in my favor. I can't help it. I just win every time. You wake up every day with an expectation because he's the source of everything. He has made me an inlet and an outlet of everything and my God has got it all under control. If you believe it, say yes right now. Wow. Secondly, we got to learn, don't miss this, embrace the process that grace unleashes. Oh my goodness, this is a tough one. We need to understand that on this journey of the soul, the soul, this is not a spiritual growth thing, it's a soul growth thing. The journey is soul. You change this and start drawing from this, this is actually like a like a connector that's bringing this into this world. If you're going to change these circumstances externally, it's not coming outside in. Guess what? Everything you need is coming from the inside out. That's why I got to remind you over and over again, you lack nothing. When's the last time you talked to a believer and said, how you doing? He says, well, I don't lack anything. Most people you talk, well, how you doing? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. You're a believer. How you doing? Well, I'm just really struggling. I don't know. I don't know. What, you, know you know why? You know why we hear that so much? Watch. Because we're living in this realm, not this realm. You live in this realm, it's death and all the progressive effects of death. Anxiety, fear, worry, frustration, anger, division, Upset. Watch. You live from this world, and Paul said there's only life and peace. You have a choice. You have a choice. You can choose. And you got to choose to embrace the process, the process, the process, the process, the process. Soul, process, process. See, only old school folk know what a crock pot is. Only the new generation knows what a microwave is. Come on. And I get it, we live in a microwave culture. We don't like to wait very long for anything. My goodness, fast food, drive through restaurants. Well, I'm upset, why? I had to wait two more minutes in line. <laughs> on demand, on demand entertainment, on demand. You know what this has done? Let me tell you something. Instant, instant banking, instant internet, instant everything. And here's what's sad. We think that's the way it is on our spiritual journey when it comes to the soul. It absolutely amazes me. You'll see people, they're upset, leaving the church, angry, upset. Well, it didn't happen fast enough, and I'm out of here, and I, and, I, and I didn't get what I wanted. It took you 42 years to get in the mess, <laughs> and now you got to be out tonight. Took you 42 years to get that jacked up, messed up, whacked out thinking pattern in your life. And now you're upset. Well, I've been in church for like three months. <laughs> there are some things in life, and you know what I've realized? It's the best things that you can't take shortcuts. 
And the process of discipleship is chief among them. And here's the good news. Are you ready for this? Discipleship under the new covenant is much different. And the Bible says much better than it was under the old. Because of the old, what would you do? In the Jewish, in the Jewish uh, ancient Jews, what would they do? They'd, they'd disciple. We call it disciple. Old, old, old covenant discipleship is what? Well, I got to find a mentor. And then I got to meticulously study their every move. And over time, then I'll train myself to imitate my mentor in such a way that I emulate their skills, their discipleships, their talents, their strengths, and that's what the church has done. We think we imitate. Well, what would Jesus do? And then I'll try to do that. Good luck with that, because Jesus did what you could never do. Watch, believer. We don't imitate. We participate. You miss that. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You're the branch. Branch, what are you connected to? Where's the sap? Where's the life? Where's the joy? Where's the peace? Who are you? You're the branch. You're just connected. Guess what you do? Oh, just rest. And the sap that's in the vine flows through the branch. Watch, you don't even produce it. You only bear it. We're not imitating we're participating. It's not imitation, it's participation. It's the difference between pretending and participating. Do you want to know why so many believers quit? I'll tell you why. It's the difference between pretending and participating. Pretending leads to acting and the church is full of actors. While partaking leads to enjoyment. Jesus didn't come so we could pretend to have abundant life. He came so we could partake of his life. I don't pretend to have joy. Y'all, I'm about ready to run right now. I partake of Mr. Joy himself. I don't pretend to have peace. I partake from the life of the Prince of Peace. I don't pretend to be blessed. I partake, are y'all getting this, from the blessing. If y'all are getting this, say yes. That's why Peter says that we have now become what? Partakers of his divine nature. It's why Paul tells us that whoever's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. It isn't that we become God, but we do become spiritually unified with him as branches to the vine. Now, if, 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 you, if you've ever driven past the vineyard, watch this. I've got, a, I've got a word for you today. If you've ever driven past the vineyard, you know that growing fruit is not an overnight process. There are some key factors you don't realize that me being in a gospel circle is like health healthy soil and adequate water and proper sunlight, me being in community, me being in the local church, it's just working the soil of my heart, me spending time in the garden of my heart, meditating and changing my mind and filling my mind with the word of God and, and becoming aware of what God knows to be true. Let me tell you something, that vine, that stalk, that trunk is receiving its nourishment. That, 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 that nutrient-rich sap of that vine starts flowing directly in and through the branches. And I want to say this to you today, and it's, it's an encouraging word for some of you that have been struggling in this season. And you've got to understand, fruit is not always detectable in every season, but there's something going on, and I feel this strong today. I've got a word for you. What if I told you that you could stop worrying about being on schedule? Because I talked to a whole lot of people they call themselves believers, and they're always saying things like this. Well, I don't know if I'm on schedule. I feel like I'm late, and I feel like I'm early. And what if I told you that the vital grace of God will produce days when it seems like there's a lot going on visibly, and then there's other days when stuff is happening under the surface in order for a future crop or fruit to eventually arrive. And some of you need to hear this badly right now. It's a word. May you receive it. Some of you need to stop condemning yourself for not being able to bear tomorrow's fruit under today's circumstances. And my friends, you are not 
behind schedule. Lift up your hands. I declare over you, believer, you are not behind schedule. Jesus and Jesus alone is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is the one who is faithful to complete the work that he has begun in you. You are his workmanship. You are his masterpiece. You are not your own. And if you are going to experience the joy of an authentic life in Christ, you need to begin to walk in faith in the fact that even when it isn't yet harvest season, he is working every single day under the surface to produce great things through you up around the corner. And if I got a church that believes it, clap your hands and give God praise right now. Say it out loud. Say, I believe it. Say, I receive it now. Now let me close with this right here. Let me close with this. And this point right here, let me tell you, I feel like I need to pastor. And so I'm not just shouting this at you. Let me tell you something. I want to father you for a moment. Pastor, will you disciple me? Don't, don't say that to me, please. Pastor, disciple me. Don't say that. Because the word disciple, we get another word from it called discipline. And by the way, when are you going to learn that discipline is not punishment for your past? It's actually course correction for your future. When I have sons that are in their little boat and they're heading toward the rocks and I discipline them or course correct them, I'm not wanting to hurt them. I'm wanting to move them away from the rocks so they can sail and not wreck their lives. And I'm telling you, this past year, I have watched people who, when everything was going on, looked like they had it together, and all it took was a shaking to reveal what was truly going on in hearts. And fall apart. That's why I want to say this, and I want to be very clear today, and I want to father you and listen to me. Enjoy the position that trust and obedience place you in. Now, what do I mean by this? Because a lot of us true gospel preachers, we get slammed by conventional Christians because we're falsely accused of ignoring the importance of obedience and that could not be further from the truth. The truth is that we care greatly about walking in obedience to God, but we also care greatly about what? About not putting the cart before the horse. You see, for those who are stuck under an old covenant mindset, an old covenant way of thinking and operating, they exist, remember, under that if then, if then, if then mentality. If I do this, then God will do this. That's why you obey. If I do this, then God will do this. If I forgive, then God will forgive, Old Covenant. If I love, then God will love me. If I bless, then God will bless me. If then, if then. But under the new system, let me tell you something, God rigged it in your favor. Dealt with the old, raised you up in the new, old gone, new has come. Watch, it's no longer if then, watch believer, it's now since therefore. Since, therefore, not if then, since God has already blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, therefore, I choose to live from the resources of that blessing. I choose to be a blessing. Since God has crucified my old man and given me new life and new identity in Christ, therefore, I choose to live in the new way of life. Since God has graced me to be a partaker of his divine nature, therefore I will draw my power from him, trusting him to produce fruit in me for every season. Since God has paid the price for every act of disobedience I ever have or ever will commit, therefore, watch, I desire to obey him with an obedience, watch, an obedience that is now from the heart, not motivated by guilt and fear and manipulation and arm twisting but now 
I obey, watch, out of thankfulness and gratitude. The point I'm trying to make, write this down. Watch. Obedience is never about earning a reward, but it is extremely rewarding. Obedience is never about earning a, a, a reward, but it is extremely rewarding. Two reasons why I love to obey God. Some of you want to see that flow in your life. Let me tell you something. Two reasons I love. One is gratitude. The other one is wisdom. I've already talked about gratitude. Now let me talk about wisdom, and I'm going to pastor you. Give me one minute. There's wisdom in walking according to God's Word. As a matter of fact, Dr. Andrew Farley, who endorsed my book, likes to say it this way. God has the market cornered on fulfillment. And if I trust that God knows what will truly fulfill me, then I can more easily deny the false promises of the world, the flesh, and the devil in favor of obedience to Him. Again, obeying is not about earning a reward. But let me tell you, at the same time, it's so rewarding. Let me say it like this. Obedience puts us in the best position possible to enjoy the flow of God's blessing. Paul told the Galatians, watch this, you reap what you sow. And some of you think that has to do with your standing with God. No, it doesn't. You are safe and secure. There's nothing you can do to dismantle it or disrupt it. You ought to take a deep breath and say, thank you, Jesus. But I will say this. It is possible to bring negative earthly consequences into our lives if we choose to live foolishly rather than wisely. Do you know how set free you are? Watch. You are so free, guess what? You can choose to make any decision you want, including a foolish one. That's how free you are. You're so free, you can make any decision you want, including a foolish one. Don't miss this. But there will be consequences. How many of you know if I rob somebody, there will be earthly consequences. And isn't it funny? Some of us will say, well, God's, I robbed somebody and now I gotta deal with it. God's trying to teach me something. Wrong! What is he trying to teach you? Your choice is doing a good job teaching you. If I murder somebody, how many of you know there's gonna be consequences? If I allow substance to have addictive power over me, there will be earthly consequences. I don't need a law to tell me, don't cheat on your wife. Let me tell you why. I don't cheat on my wife because I love my wife. You don't think there would be consequences? Well, what I do in my private life has nothing to do with my public life. Really? You don't think if I cheated on my wife, you don't think there's earthly consequences. You don't think I'd affect a nearly 30 year life together. You don't think I'd affect generations, my children and their children. You don't think I would affect a local church. You don't think I wouldn't affect a nation. You don't think I wouldn't affect the people in my world. You don't think I, you think there are no consequences. But when we're living obediently, here's what we're doing. We are positioning ourselves to reap the most positive earthly consequences possible. And I know there's a whole lot in the series that I didn't get to, a whole lot in the book I didn't get to, a whole lot you need to go online and watch, a whole lot you need to get out of the book, but I just came today to tell you, our hope, my hope, our team's hope is what? That as you journey in this revelation, you get better footing. And I'll tell you right now, grace is not God's plan A because it is his plan A because there's never a plan B. There's never a plan B. It is always his plan A, which means we need to know that this new life, what it means and how it works in us. And as we continue to grow in grace, my heart is your pastor is what? That you will allow your heart to be captured by grace. For the next few moments, lift up your hands, lower floor, upper tier. Some of you have been captured by distraction. Some of you have been captured by comparison. Some of you have been captured by perfectionism. Some of you have been captured by legalism. Some of you have been captured by 
by moralism. Some of you have been captured by man-made religion. Some of you have been captured by churchianity. Some of you have been captured by the jungle of believing that me and God are still at war. But may you hear the voice of the Lord today. May you hear Jesus today declaring and we declare that the war is over and the only way you'll walk in the vitality of God's grace each and every day is when you are captured by him with your hands lifted just receive right now in the name of Jesus come on all over this place just receive right now thank you Jesus we receive right now we freely receive what you give I receive Jesus. You're not late. You're not early. I declare over you. You're right on time. If you don't want it, I'll take it. You're right on time. That feels good just saying it today. Lift up those hands. You wake up tomorrow, that feeling inside. Oh, God, I'm late. See, some of you wake up, this is non at you. I'm late. I'm late for something. I just... I don't know, I've missed it. I've already missed it. I've already missed the goodness. I've already missed it. I'm, I'm, I'm too late. No, you're right on time. You're right on time. Oh, yeah. You're right on time. Y'all, I'm feeling this thing. Right on time. Lift up those hands, just receive here the Spirit of God. You're not late, you're not early. Say it right on time. I double dog dare you to say it like you believe it and make it personal. Say it. I'm right on time. Put some shoulder in this thing. Right on time. I'm right on time. Say it out loud. Come on. I'm right on time. Well, that'll change the way you live every day. What are you going to say tomorrow when you don't feel it? Right on time. You talk about walking in security. You talk about walking in safety. You talk about walking in confidence. Lift up those hands and say it out loud. Say, I'm right on time. Say it again. The world's screaming at you. You're late, you're late. You hadn't arrived. No, I'm, I'm going to live from right here. Remind myself. On time, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. Rest for what? Rest for your soul. Rest for your soul. Talk to me, man. Rest for your soul. Rest for your soul. See, some of you, your soul, your mind's out of control. That's where you're losing the battle. It's like racing. Your mind's like this. That's why you can't sleep at night. But the righteous, they sleep. And their sleep is sweet. Lift up your hands if you had not been sleeping well. In the name of Jesus, I declare right now, tonight, you're going to sleep. And your sleep's going to be sweet. I come against anxiety attacks. I come against suicidal thoughts. I come against anxiousness. I come against worry. I come against fear. You're right on time. If you believe it, shout out right now and give God praise. Say it. I'm right on time. I can't hear you, Jesus. 
church. Talk. Say it out loud. Talk back. Say it. Say it. I can't hear you up in here. Throw your hands up. Say it out loud. of this week when your mind goes out of control. Don't push me. Don't push me. Say it. One more time, say it. If you believe it, clap your hands and give God praise. Come on. Y'all looking at me crazy. You say, Ben Daly, does that work for you? I don't know. If it, don't, if, if it ain't real, don't tell me because I've been enjoying it. I've been enjoying it for nine years now. Don't wake me up. If it ain't real, don't wake me up. It's been too good. There's a healing anointing. If you've been sick in your bodies, lift your hands right now. And by the way, it's not coming from the outside in. Lift up your hands. There's healing right now flowing from inside, out of your belly flow. Rivers of living water healing coming from the inside out. Lift up your hands and say, I've already got it. In the name of Jesus, I speak healing right now of your bodies. Just receive right now. Over your minds. I speak healing now in the name of Jesus. The authority of the name of Jesus. Right now, I speak healing. Right there where you are with hands lifted, just say, I believe it and I receive it right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Wow. Say it out loud. Say, I'm right on time. Thank you, Jesus. Before we walk out of this place, you are right on time. I haven't done our Giver's Confession 2021, Giver's Confession, in a minute. Some of you have been asking me, where is it? Well, we're going to say it together again. And by the way, because you are the righteousness of God, you have every reason to expect what we declare. So lift up your hands, every one of you. And let's say it together out loud. Use your voice. Let's say it together out loud. Ready? Read. As I give today, I am believing the Lord for, say it, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decreased, blessings and increase say it thank you lord for meeting all of my financial needs in 2021 that i may have what to give into the kingdom of god and promote the gospel of grace to who as we close out this month of june it's critical every giver right now oh what did i say let's see let's go back and look i said by the way, our giving is an act of obedience. Here it is. I thought it was so good, it blessed me. Obedience is never about earning a reward. It's just extremely rewarding. Some of you don't realize obeying God puts you in the best position possible to enjoy the blessings of God. Why are you not trusting Him in this area? It's time. And so right now, before we speak this blessing over you, you walk out of here, whether you're giving at calvarychurch.cc or on the app, set up your reoccurring giving or text to give or envelope. Father, I thank you for every generous person in this house right on time. We come to this moment and we trust you. This is an act of obedience. We give you what's first. In Jesus' name, we give you what's best. And I thank you for just a flow of your favor a flow, an ongoing flow of your favor that we just enjoy. In Jesus' name, I thank you. I'm declaring it's going to be the greatest year. 
just gets brighter and brighter for the righteous. We receive your word today as we close this series. We've been captured by grace, and now your life spills out of us in this way. In Jesus' name, we all said together, amen. Let's give to the Lord right now. Come on, let's.